Welcome to the British International Sports Medicine Academy. In this lesson, we're covering the level four unit, Systems of the Human Body, which forms part of our level four qualification in nutrition for weight management and sports performance. Our session aims to understand the structure and function of the skin, the skeletal system, the muscular system, the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the endocrine system, the digestive system, the urinary system, the reproductive system, and lastly, the lymphatic system. Skin. The skin is our largest external organ and has three main layers, the epidermis, the dermis, and our subcutaneous tissue. The epidermis is our top layer of skin. It's constantly shedding dead skin cells from the top layer and replacing them with new healthy cells that develop within the lower layers. Our pores are located within the epidermis, which allow for water and oils to escape. The dermis is a thicker layer of skin than the epidermis. Our sweat and oil glands, hair follicles, connective tissues, nerve endings, and lymph vessels are found within this layer. The dermis is the layer of skin that protects us from pathogens. It also contains collagen and elastin, which support the structure of the skin. The layer of skin beneath the dermis is called the subcutaneous fat, also known as subcutis or hypodermis layer. It insulates the body, which keeps us warm. It also acts as a shock absorber or cushion by surrounding our vital organs. This is the layer that attaches to our muscles and tissues. Functions of the skin. Let's begin with protection. The skin provides a barrier between our bodies and the environment, protecting us from environmental stressors, such as pollution, radiation, germs, and the sun. Body temperature. The skin helps us to regulate our body temperature with its immense blood supply. Dilated blood vessels allow for heat loss and constricted vessels retain heat. Sensory reception. The skin is our largest sensory organ. It regularly receives sensory information through touch, feeling sensations and communicating to the brain what's going on around us. Lastly, storage. Our skin stores water, fat, and vitamin D. The skeletal system. Functions of our skeletal system. Movement. Our bones attach to each other via ligaments and our muscles attach to bones via tendons, which are both forms of connective tissue. As our muscles contract or shorten, they pull on our bones, which creates movement. Storage. Our bones store minerals, such as calcium and magnesium phosphate. These minerals help with bone growth. When minerals are in low stores, bones can become weak and this can lead to osteoporosis. Structure. The skeleton gives the body shape and provides a framework for muscle attachment. Protection. Bones protect our internal organs, for example, the rib cage protects the heart and the lungs. The skull protects the brain. The vertebrae protect the spinal cord. And the pelvis protects our reproductive organs. Production. Within the bone marrow of specific bones, we produce white and red blood cells. Skeletal classifications. We classify our skeleton into two categories. The appendicular skeleton consists of 126 bones, and the main function of the appendicular skeleton is to provide movement. It consists of our levers, which include bones of the shoulder girdle, arms, hands, and the pelvic girdle, legs, and feet. 
The axioskeleton consists of 80 bones and its main function is to provide protection. It lies on the long axis or midline of the body and includes the cranium or skull, the vertebrae, the sternum and rib cage. Bones. On this slide, we've shown the main bones within the human body. You have the cranium or skull, the clavicle or collarbone, the scapula or shoulder blades, the humerus, which is the long bone in your upper arm, the sternum or breastbone, your rib cage, your ulna and radius, which are your forearm bones, your carpals, which are your wrist bones, and your metacarpals, which are the bones within your hands, your phalanges, which are your fingers. Moving down to the pelvis, you have your ilium, your ischium, and your pubic bones. Let's not forget about the vertebral column. You have your cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal vertebrae. You have your femur, which is your thigh bone. Your tibia and fibula, which are the long bones in your lower leg. Your patella, which is your kneecap. And your tarsal bones, which are your ankles. Your metatarsals, which are the bones in your feet. And your phalanges, which are your toes. Bone classifications. We have five categories in which we use to classify our bones. Long bones, short bones, irregular bones, flat bones, and sesamoid bones. Long bones are our levers that allow for movement through muscle attachment, for example, the humerus and the femur. Short bones allow for both movement and strength, for example, the carpals and tarsal bones. Irregular bones provide protection, for example, the vertebrae. Flat bones offer protection as well as a flat surface for muscle attachment. For example, the ilium within our pelvis. Sesamoid bones allow for movement and stabilization. For example, the patella within the knee joint. In this image, we show the structure of a long bone. Lining the ends of the bone, we have cartilage. The bone ends are called the epiphyses. The long shaft of the bone that consists of compact bone is called the diaphysis. It's within the epiphysis that you can find the epiphyseal plate or growth plate, where spongy bone is found. And it's also within the epiphysis that we have the epiphyseal line. Within the diaphysis, which is the shaft of the bone, you have the medulla cavity. Within the medulla cavity is where you find bone marrow. The bone is also surrounded by a nutrient layer called the periosteum. Bone growth. Two months after conception, a group of cells join together to form a bone. They begin secreting a cartilage matrix. In the middle of the cartilage-shaped bones, large cells develop and then burst which stimulates the outside cartilage to harden into bone. The hardened bone restricts nutrients from getting in, causing the inside cells to begin to die. A nutrient artery then penetrates the bone, bringing in nutrients, such as calcium and magnesium. This triggers osteoblasts to begin laying down bone matrix and osteoclasts to begin clearing away bone in the middle of the matrix, creating a cavity for bone marrow. The epiphyseal or growth plates are also important to this process. It's an active site for cartilage and bone growth. The process of osteoblasts laying down new bone and osteoclasts clearing old bone continues until bone maturation which is usually complete by the age of 25. At this point, the epiphyseal plate begins to fade, leaving behind the epiphyseal line, which signifies that bones have stopped growing. This full process is known as ossification. Bone remodeling 
is an active and ever-changing process that relies on the correct balance between bone resorption by osteoclast and bone deposition by osteoblast. Weight-bearing exercise helps to maintain this balance and plays an important role in strengthening our bones through remodeling. Bone repair occurs in four stages and can take several months. The first stage is the hematoma formation. Blood vessels within the broken bone tear and hemorrhage, causing the blood to clot, forming a hematoma at the site of the break. The blood vessels at the broken ends of the bone are sealed off by the clotting process, causing the bone cells that are unable to access nutrients to begin to die. The second stage is bone generation. After a few days, the capillaries grow into the hematoma and the dead bone cells are removed. Fibroblast and osteoblast enter the area and begin to reform bone. Fibroblasts produce collagen fibers that connect the broken bone ends, while osteoblasts start to form spongy bone. The repair tissue, fibrocartilaginous callus, begins to join the bone parts together. The next stage is the bony callus formation. The fibrocartilaginous callus is converted into a bony callus of spongy bone. It takes approximately two months for the broken bone ends to be firmly joined together after the fracture. The last stage is bone remodeling. The bony callus is then remolded by osteoclast and osteoblast. Compact bone is added to create bone tissue that's similar to the original unbroken bone. This remodeling can take many months and the bone may remain uneven for years. The nervous system. Our nervous system maintains balance or homeostasis in the body. It has three main functions, sensory input, interpretation, and motor output. Simply put, our nervous system is responsible for sensing changes within the internal and external environment, analyzing the information, and activating the correct bodily system in response. The structure of the nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. The CNS receives messages from the peripheral nervous system, the PNS. It interprets the information and sends out the correct motor response. Our peripheral nervous system has two branches, the somatic and autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system is a branch of the PNS concerned with changes in the external environment. It senses movement, touch, pain, skin temperature, and so forth, and it is under our conscious control. The autonomic nervous system is a branch of the PNS concerned with changes in the internal environment. It senses hormonal status, the functioning of our internal organs, it controls cardiac and smooth involuntary muscles, and our endocrine glands that secrete hormones. The autonomic nervous system is not under our conscious control. The autonomic nervous system has two further subdivisions, the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of the nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for the body's fight or flight response. The parasympathetic nervous system restores the body back to a state of rest or calm by preventing it from overworking. The peripheral nervous system consists of the incoming and outgoing nerves to the spinal cord. We group these nerves into afferent or efferent nerves. Afferent nerves are sensory neurons which carry information about a change. Efferent nerves carry information about the required response to the change. Muscle structure and function. Types of muscle tissue. Muscles are involved in every function of the body. 
The muscular system consists of over 600 muscles, including the three types of muscle, smooth, skeletal, and cardiac. Only skeletal muscles are voluntary, meaning we control them consciously. Smooth and cardiac muscles act involuntarily. On this slide is a diagram showing the structure of skeletal muscle. The epimyceum is a fibrous tissue that surrounds the entire muscle. The perimyceum is tissue that surrounds a bundle of muscle fibers. The fasciculi is a bundle of muscle fibers. The endomyceum surrounds each individual muscle fiber. A muscle fiber is a muscle cell, which is a basic building block of muscle. The myofibrils are found within the muscle fibers, and along the myofibrils we have sarcomere. Sarcomere are the smallest contractile units within a muscle cell, and it's within the sarcomere that you find are thin protein contractile filaments, myosin and actin, that cause our muscles to contract and shorten. Functions of the muscular system. Muscles are involved in every function of the body. Let's begin with movement. Our muscles contract, which allows for movement to take place. Circulation. Cardiac and smooth muscles help our heart beat and help blood to flow through our bodies by producing electrical impulses. The cardiac muscle or myocardium is found within the heart. It's controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Our blood vessels are made up of smooth muscle and are also controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Respiration. Our diaphragm is the main muscle at work during relaxed breathing. When we breathe heavier, we utilize additional muscles along the rib cage and abdominum. Digestion. Digestion is controlled by smooth muscles found in our gastrointestinal tract or GI tract. Our smooth muscle contracts and relaxes as food passes through the body during digestion. Then muscles also help to push food out of the body through defecation or vomiting when we're sick. Urination. Smooth and skeletal muscles make up the urinary system, allowing us to urinate. Childbirth. Smooth muscles are found within the uterus. During pregnancy, these muscles grow and stretch as the baby grows. When a woman goes into labor, the smooth muscles of the uterus contract and relax to help push the baby through the vaginal canal. Vision. Our eye sockets are made up of six skeletal muscles that help move the eyes. And the internal muscles of our eyes are made up of smooth muscle. These muscles work together to help us see. Stability and posture. The skeletal muscles within our core help protect our spine and help with stability. The core muscle group includes the abdominal muscles, the back, and the pelvic muscles. This group is also known as the trunk. The stronger your core, the better you can stabilize your body. Your skeletal muscles also control posture. Flexibility and strength are keys to maintaining proper posture. Stiff neck muscles, Weak back muscles or tight hip muscles can throw off our alignment. Poor posture can lead to joint pain and weakened muscles. Muscle contractions. We have two types of muscle contraction, isotonic and isometric. Isotonic contractions have two phases. The concentric phase is when the muscle shortens under resistance, and the eccentric phase is when the muscle lengthens under resistance. Isometric contractions are where the muscle is active at a fixed length under resistance, for example during a plank or wall sit. Muscles and muscle actions. 
On this slide, we've shown an anterior view of your muscular system. Let's begin with the deltoid or shoulder muscle. The deltoid has three separate origins, the clavicle, the chromion, and the spine of the scapula. It inserts onto the humerus almost halfway down the humerus bone. Your pectoralis major muscle, found within the chest, originates on the clavicle and sternum bones. It also inserts onto the humerus bone. The biceps brachii originate on the scapula and insert on the top of the radius bone. The rectus abdominis originates within our pubis and pubis symphysis and it inserts onto the cartilage of ribs five to seven, as well as the base of the sternum. Our adductor muscles originate within the pubis and insert onto the femur bone. Our quadriceps originate within our pelvic bones and insert onto the tibia. Our tibialis anterior originates on the tibia and inserts onto the metatarsal bones. On this slide, we have the posterior view of the muscular system. Let's begin with the trapezius, which originates on our seventh cervical vertebrae, as well as all of our thoracic vertebrae. It inserts onto the clavicle and scapula. Under the trapezius, you have the rhomboid muscle, which originates on C7, as well as the upper thoracic vertebrae and it inserts onto the scapula. On the back of the upper arm, we have the triceps brachii, which originate on the scapula and insert onto the top of the ulna bone. The erector spinae originates on the ribs and iliac crest, and it inserts onto the cervical vertebrae as well as the ribs superior to the origin. The gluteus maximus originates on the sacrum and coccyx, and it inserts onto the femur bone. The hamstring muscles originate on the ischium and insert onto the tibia and fibula. The gastronemius or calf muscle originates on the femur just above the knee and inserts onto our calcaneus or heel bone. The soleus muscle originates on the tibia and fibula, and also inserts onto the calcaneus. The heart and circulatory system. The heart or myocardium is a muscle, which is located in the chest slightly to the left. The function of the heart is to pump blood to allow circulation. The right side of the heart carries deoxygenated blood and the left oxygenated blood. Our heart has four chambers, two upper collecting chambers, namely atria, and two lower pumping chambers, namely ventricles. We also have valves within the heart that ensure the flow of blood is one way. It's important to note that the heart has its own blood supply. Coronary arteries supply our heart muscle with oxygenated blood. Circulation of blood through the heart. Let's begin in the lungs where we inhale oxygen, allowing for pulmonary diffusion to take place. The oxygenated blood flows into the heart from the lungs via the pulmonary vein and enters the left atrium. It then flows into the left ventricle via the bicuspid or mitral valve. The left ventricle then pumps blood to the body via the aorta and through the aortic valve. After tissue diffusion, the deoxygenated blood flows back to the right atrium via the vena cava. Then the blood flows into the right ventricle via the tricuspid valve. The deoxygenated blood is then transported back to the lungs through the pulmonary valve and pulmonary artery. Blood composition. Approximately 55% of our blood is plasma, which is a clear straw-colored liquid which carries platelets, red and white blood cells, 
and it contains over 700 proteins and other substances. Blood has many different functions, including transporting oxygen and nutrients to the lungs and bodily tissues, as well as forming blood clots to prevent excess blood loss. Blood pressure is the pressure within the arteries. It is measured by systolic pressure, when the heart contracts, and diastolic pressure, when the heart relaxes. Normal blood pressure readings are approximately 120 over 80. Stage 1 hypertensive blood pressure readings are 140 systolic over 90 diastolic and above. Poor diet and inactivity over time will increase blood pressure and lead to hypertension. In the long term, regular exercise can reduce blood pressure. The respiratory system. Our lungs are located within our chest and protected by our rib cage. We have two lungs and when we inhale and exhale, our diaphragm and intercostal muscles assist. The diaphragm is a dome-shaped muscle found under our lungs. As the diaphragm contracts, it increases the abdominal cavity, allowing more room for the lungs to expand. The intercostal muscles run along the rib cage and expand and relax the rib cage, which allows for breathing. Our diaphragm contracts during inspiration and relaxes during expiration. The respiratory system. We inhale air through the nose. It flows down the throat, the pharynx and larynx into the trachea, also known as the windpipe, and branches off into the lungs through the bronchus, which lead to the bronchi and bronchioles, and lastly to the alveoli. It is within the alveoli where diffusion or gaseous exchange takes place. The flow of air into the lungs can be summarized with the acronym Nice People Like to Breathe Better Air. Nose, pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, and alveoli. The endocrine system. The endocrine system works closely with the nervous system to maintain homeostasis or balance within the body. If our central nervous system receives information from afferent nerves to show that the body is out of a homeostatic state, then efferent nerves may send information to directly stimulate a response, or they may send information to an endocrine gland to release a hormone. Hormones are chemical messengers. On this slide, we have a picture showing the main endocrine glands. Beginning with the hypothalamus, you then have the pituitary gland, the thyroid gland. Behind the thyroid, we have the parathyroid gland. You have the thymus, the adrenal glands, the pancreas, and then the ovaries and testes. The hypothalamus and pituitary gland release the growth hormone, which promotes growth, particularly in children and young adults, promotes muscle mass, and increases fat metabolism. The adrenals, which are located on top of both of our kidneys, release the hormones adrenaline, noradrenaline, and corticosteroids. The adrenal's main function is to facilitate the sympathetic nervous system activity. The thyroid gland releases thyroxin, which also promotes muscle mass, promotes growth in children and young adults, and increases fat metabolism. The parathyroid gland releases the parathyroid hormone, which controls the levels of blood calcium which is important for muscle contraction, as well as nerve impulse transmission. From the pancreas, we release the hormones insulin and glucagon, which work together to control our blood sugar levels. 
From the ovaries, we release estrogen and progesterone, which promote female or feminine characteristics. From the testes, males release the hormone testosterone, which promotes masculine characteristics. The digestive system. The digestive system or alimentary canal begins within our mouths. We intake food into the mouth. It's within our mouths that both chemical and mechanical digestion begin. Through mastication or chewing, we break down food into smaller components and the tongue rolls it into bowls that we can swallow. Our saliva contains an enzyme, salivary amylase, which begins to break down carbohydrates. Food then moves down the esophagus to the stomach through a process of peristalsis. Peristalsis is the rhythmical waves of smooth muscle contractions, which helps to move the food towards the stomach. No physical or chemical digestion takes place within our esophagus. The smooth muscle within our stomach works to break down the food chunks further into thick liquid called chyme. We begin to break down both fats and protein within the stomach through the action of enzymes, namely pepsin, which breaks down proteins, and peptides and gastric lipase, which break down fats. These enzymes must work in acidic conditions, so the cells within the stomach release hydrochloric acid into the stomach cavity. The stomach also produces a thick mucus layer which protects it from damage. The food then moves into the small intestine, which is the main site for digestion and absorption. It's where all food is broken down into the components that the body can readily use. The small intestine has three parts, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. The pancreas and liver release enzymes that further break down food. Bile released from the liver breaks down fats so that the lipase enzymes can work. The small intestine is also where the nutrients are absorbed into the bloodstream. The surface of the small intestine is covered with tiny villi which provide a large space for capillaries to transport nutrients into the bloodstream. In the large intestine, we break down soluble fiber and absorb any remaining water. The undigested food and fibers are then passed through the colon and leave the body as feces through the rectum or anus. Functions of the digestive system we use our digestive system to ingest and digest food, to absorb, release nutrients, and excrete the parts of food that are indigestible. The six activities involved in this process are ingestion, motility, mechanical digestion, chemical digestion, absorption, and defecation. Ingestion is where we intake food into our mouths which then moves along the alimentary canal. Motility refers to the movement of food along the digestive tract. Mechanical digestion refers to the chewing within the mouth, known as mastication, as well as the churning within the stomach. Chemical digestion is the action of enzymes to break down food. Absorption takes place within the small intestine and defecation from the rectum or anal canal. The urinary system. The functions of the urinary system. To remove waste products from the body, to balance the body's fluids, to balance the body's electrolytes, to release hormones to help control blood pressure, to release a hormone to control red blood cell production, and to help with bone health by controlling calcium and phosphorus levels. The structure of the urinary system. After we absorb the nutrients from food that we need, waste products are left behind within the intestines, as well as in the blood, 
The kidneys and urinary system help the body to remove urea or liquid waste. They also help to keep chemicals or electrolytes, such as potassium and sodium, and water in balance. Urea, liquid waste, is produced when foods containing protein are broken down within the body. Urea is carried in the blood to the kidneys. This is where it is removed along with water and other waste in the form of urine. Our kidneys control blood pressure and produce a hormone which regulates red blood cell production within the bone marrow. The kidneys also maintain the acid balance within the body and conserve fluids. The kidneys remove urea from the blood through tiny filtering units called nephrons, formed of small blood capillaries. Urea, together with water and other waste substances, are used then to form urine. We have two ureters. These narrow tubes carry urine from the kidneys to the bladder. Muscles in the ureter walls keep tightening and relaxing. This forces urine downward away from the kidneys. If urine backs up or is allowed to stand still, a kidney infection can develop. About every 10 to 15 seconds, small amounts of urine are emptied into the bladder from the ureters. Our bladder is a hollow organ located in our lower belly. The bladder's walls relax and expand to store urine. They contract and flatten to empty urine through the urethra. A healthy adult bladder can store up to two cups of urine for two to five hours. We have two sphincter muscles. These circular muscles help keep urine from leaking by closing tightly like a rubber band around the opening of the bladder. The nerves in the bladder alert us when it is time to urinate or empty the bladder. The urethra is the tube that allows urine to pass outside the body. The reproduction system. Functions of the reproduction system are to produce hormones, to produce an egg or sperm cells, to transport or discharge and sustain these cells, and to nurture the developing offspring. Let's begin with the structure of the female reproduction system. The ovaries produce eggs and hormones. The ovaries are small glands that are located on either side of the uterus. The fallopian tubes are narrow tubes that act as tunnels for the egg cells to travel from the ovaries to the uterus. During conception, an egg is usually fertilized by a sperm in the fallopian tubes. The fertilized egg then travels to the uterus where it implants into the lining of the uterus. The uterus or womb is a hollow organ that is where a fetus develops. The uterus is divided into two parts, the cervix, which is the lower part that opens into the vagina, and the main body of the uterus called the corpus. Sperm enters through a passage in the cervix that is also where menstrual blood exits. The vagina is a canal that joins the cervix, the lower part of the uterus, to the outside of the body. Now let's look at the male reproduction system. The penis is an external organ. It allows for men to release urine through the urethra, and when erect during sexual climax, semen, which contains sperm. The testes produce sperm and testosterone, the main male sex hormone. They live within the scrotum. The scrotum are the sac-like projections that fall under and behind the penis. They regulate the temperature for the testes. The lymphatic system. The functions of the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is a network of tissues and organs that help rid the body of toxins, waste, and unwanted materials. The main function of our lymphatic system is to transport lymph, 
a fluid containing infection fighting white blood cells throughout the body. The lymphatic system protects the body against illness causing germs, bacteria, viruses, and fungi. It builds immunity by making special white blood cells called lymphocytes that produce antibodies which are responsible for immune responses that defend the body against disease. It also helps maintain fluid levels within the body by collecting excess fluid. Fats are absorbed through the walls of the villi that surround our small intestine and enter the lacteal, which are tiny lymph vessels called lymph capillaries, where they form part of a fluid called chyle, which is a milky fluid consisting of lymph, fats, and free fatty acids. Lymphatic vessels then transport these fats into the bloodstream. The lymph fluid also carries the waste products and destroyed bacteria back into the bloodstream. Our liver and kidneys then remove these from the blood. The body passes them out with other body waste through bowel movements or urine. The structure of our lymphatic system. The lymphatic system consists of lymphatic vessels, which are similar to the veins and capillaries that we see within the circulatory system. The vessels are connected to lymph nodes, where the lymph is filtered. The tonsils, adenoids, spleen, and thymus are all part of our lymphatic system. Lymph is a clear to white fluid made of white blood cells, especially lymphocytes, the cells that attack bacteria in the blood, and fluid from the intestines called chyle, which contains fats. Lymph nodes. We have hundreds of lymph nodes around the body that are clustered in different regions, such as the groin, neck, and armpit. They're very small glands located along the lymphatic system of vessels. Lymph nodes trap viruses and bacteria so that T cells can attack. One type of our T cells present the invader or antigen to B cells so the B cells can make antibodies against the invader. It's within lymph nodes that our immune cells communicate and work together. Adenoids are small lumps of tissue at the back of the nose, above the roof of the mouth, which help fight infection and protect the body from bacteria and viruses. Adenoids are larger when we're children. They start to shrink and disappear by the time we're an adult. The thymus gland is in the chest, between the lungs, and behind the sternum. It is just in front of and above the heart. It makes white blood cells called T cells. They are an important part of the immune system, which help us to fight infection. The thymus produces all of our T cells before we become teenagers. The tonsils are small organs in the back of the throat. They prevent foreign objects from slipping into the lungs. They also filter bacteria and viruses and produce white blood cells and antibodies. The spleen is a fist-sized organ in the upper left side of our abdominum, next to the stomach and behind our left ribs. The spleen's main job is to filter our blood. It helps to regulate the number of red blood cells that carry oxygen throughout the body and the number of platelets, blood clotting cells. It does this by breaking down and removing cells that are abnormal, old, or damaged. The spleen also stores red blood cells, platelets, and infection-fighting white blood cells. The spleen plays an important role in our immune system response. When the spleen detects bacteria, viruses, or other germs in the body, it produces white blood cells called lymphocytes to fight off these infections. Take a moment to review our original session aims. Are there any areas that are still unclear? If so, we encourage you to go back and re-listen to that portion of the lesson. Thank you for listening.